Hello, this is Jim Lloyd with Folk on Two. Tonight I'll be talking to one of the most influential figures of the folk revival, Martin Carthy. Over the past 20 years, Martin Carthy has had a very successful partnership with Dave Swarbrick. He was a founder member of Steel Ice Band and made a significant contribution to the Albion Band and Brass Monkey. He's a member of the Watersons. In the theatre, he's appeared with both the Royal Shakespeare Company and the National Theatre. But his most important contribution to the folk movement is as a solo performer. <laughs> Oh, there was a woman and she lived on her own She slaved on her own and she skivvied on her own She had two little girls and two little boys And she lived all alone with her husband For her husband he was a hunk of a man A chunk of a man and a drunk of a man He was a hunk of a drunk and skunk of a man Such a bruising, bruising husband For he would come out drunk each night He thrashed her black and he thrashed her white He thrashed her to within an inch of her life Then he slept like a long did a husband One night she gathered her tears all round her shame She thought of the bruising and cried with the pain Oh, you'll not do that ever again I won't live with a drunken husband But as he lay and snored in bed A strange old thought came into her head She went for the needle, went for the thread And went straight into her sleeping husband And she started to stitch with a girlish thrill For the woman's heart and a seamstress skill She bid and tucked with an iron will All around her sleeping husband Sheet, the bottom sheet too, the blanket stitched to the mattress through. She stitched and stitched for the whole night through, and then she waited the dawn and her husband. And when her husband awoke with a pain in his head, he found that he could not move in bed. Sweet Christ, I lost the use of my legs, but this wife just smiled at her husband. For in her hand she held the frying pan with a flutter in her heart. She given him a lamb He could not move but he cried God damn Don't you swear she cries to her husband And then she thrashed him black She thrashed him blue with the frying pan And the powder too With the rolling pin just a stroke or two Such a battered and bleeding husband And she says if you ever come home drunk anymore I'll stitch you in and I'll thrash you more drunken husband Oh, isn't it true what small can do with a thread and a thought and a stitch or two He's wet his slate and he's bruising through It's goodbye to a drunken husband A stitch in time from Martin Carthy's current album Rite of Passage Martin, that's more or less where you are now musically Where did you begin? Um, my parents were people who sort of liked music, but they they tended to stick to classical music, or they would go for the um, the odd things like Phil Harris and uh, the Rich Maharaja of Mogador and Frank Crummett and Leslie Cerrone. They had their, their, their selection of music wasn't wasn't what you would call wide, but it was it was probably two extremes. Um, and not much in the middle. They weren't, fo they weren't fond of light opera, they were fond of opera, they weren't fond of operetta, if you like. Um, they didn't like uh, things like Mantovani, they liked the real thing. They wanted to have a full, a full orchestra conducted by Toscanini, you know. Were they musical people themselves? Did um, you have any musicians in your family? My aunt is a piano player. Um, She'd started learning fairly early on, and she, she had to give it up. My parents, my, my father comes from the East End, of London, and um, he won a scholarship to the grammar school across the bridge at, uh, at Tower, across Tower Bridge, St Olive's Grammar School. And in order for him to go to school, she had to go out to work. I mean, that was that was the way of it. And she just accepted that. But she she played then, and she plays now, and she's a very good piano player too. 
But did you actually hear much of her playing in your own home, or was most of your influence from well, records, radio? Well, we would hear, Tr Trudy would come in, and uh, when Christmas and birthdays, she would come in and she'd play a bit when she got a couple inside her. And it was always a little bit shocking, because uh, she played um, sort of, uh, I can not quite call she played I me. Mean, she played popular, popular tunes of the time, either from memory or from or from music, and she was a she's she is a really a, a really energetic piano player. Um, she didn't play the classics, not when we were all around anyway. I presume she can. I've never heard her play classics. Her favourite piano player was Charlie Coons, and this was the sort of beginning of of uh, of any. Well, later on, I, I, I began to sort of go for the, m what my parents considered the more disreputable side of music, and this was the first inkling, if you like. And later on, when I was like 14 or something, and I dis 15 maybe, and I discovered Lonnie Donegan and heard about jazz clubs, I used to go to Cy Laurie's Jazz Club on a Sunday afternoon. I wasn't allowed to go in the evening because there were reefers there. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what the papers said. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> Well, let's not get on to the Lonnie Donegan era yet. Oh. Let, let's start with one, one of your earlier musical memories. Well, when I was about six, I think, I could have been seven, but uh, I, I think it was 59 Aberdare Gardens, which would be six or seven. Um, there was a, a record in the hit parade called The Rich Maharaja of Mogador, and we all used to wait for it to come on to, on Housewives' Choice or on Children's Choice, whichever it was, probably both, actually. Maharaja of Magador Who had 10,000 camels And maybe more He had rubies and pearls And the loveliest girls But he didn't know how to do the rumba He could afford a big reward So to his people one day he said And take my pearls, take my camels, and take my girls. Rumba lessons I wanted for the rich Maharaja of Magador. Ah, so a slick little chick answered, That's for me. Through the ad he had placed in variety. When she saw his expense, she could tell at a glance. That he'd never learn how to do the rumba He had his wealth, he had his health So he looked in her eyes and said Ah-ha! Take my rubies and take my pearls Take my camels, I'll keep my girls from now on you'll be working for the rich Maharaja of Magador. Ah! He was anxious to learn, so she taught him right. But she taught him the thrill of a moonlight night. He discovered the bliss of a half-promised kiss. But he never learned how to do the rumba And on the day she went away You could hear all the people say She took his rubies and took his pearls Took his camels and all his girls Took his money and what is more She made the rich Maharaja The poor Maharaja of Magdado Oh, 
Monroe <laughs> back in 1948. How old were you in 1948? You know? Six or seven. Yeah. Mm. Did you have a, a family record collection at that time? Oh, yes. I mean, my other very, very strong memory was um, the very first time my parents put on the revolutionary study by, uh, by Chopin, played by Corto. They wanted Schnabel, but they said Corto will do. <laughs> and uh, they put this on, and I, I, I ran away and hid. And I cried and I cried and I cried, and I wouldn't stop until they took the record off. And every time they put it on, I would somewhere, I'd be somewhere around, and I'd start crying and insist that they took it off, because it always made me cry. <laughs> used to make you feel quite weepy as a child. How do you feel about that now? Still does. Does the same effect. I think <laughs> yeah. it's wonderful. What about your own musical development? Did, did you do music at school, Martin? I did music, yes. I, I often, I, I say sometimes we had, I sort of did the, the standard music, um, music lessons at school, but we did have a, a pretty extraordinary music master at the school I went to, whose name was Gerald Wheeler. Um, and he was, he was a very young man, and he was absolutely full of it. He was absolutely full of music and bursting at the seams with it and incredibly excited about it. And he was one of those people who was actually able to communicate his excitement. He just, I mean, he had a, a class full of working class kids. Whereabouts oh, was this? In London? This was the, I actually went to the same school as my father. Mm. I went to St. Olive's Grammar School down in, it was down in to, at the end of Tooley Street on the corner of Tower Bridge Road. It's not there anymore. They moved it out of London. It's somewhere down in Kent now. And it's just called St Olive's School. Um, the headmaster was one of those people who didn't want, didn't want to become comprehensive. Mm. So he and a band of others split from London. <laughs> but um, yeah, this particular music teacher was an extraordinary man, and he just he yes, I'm sorry, uh, he'd have a, a class full of working class kids, and he'd just fire, they, they'd be all ready to giggle, and by the end of it, they weren't laughing. They were really taking part. He had. He got our school choir and he drilled it into the most phenomenal shape. It was a really fabulous choir. Um, the school orchestra wasn't so hot. But, uh, Were you in the orchestra? Uh, no, I wasn't in the orchestra. He, he was one of those... He, he actually introduced um, brass into the school orchestra and I was, I was given a trombone to learn. 
and I was really excited about it for all of three weeks, and then I got fed up with it. You were a chorister as well, I was you? a chorister, and that was, that was because of him. When I was 12, I joined uh, the, the Queen's Chapel of the Savoy Choir, and our school used to supply the choristers for the Queen's Chapel of the Savoy and half the choristers for Southwark Cathedral. Mm. And he said that, um, did I fancy being a chorister? Because uh, there was a place available at the Savoy Chapel. And I said, yes. Yeah. So I went along on the Sunday at 10 o'clock for the rehearsal. And the bloke just, the, the, uh, the master of the music was a fellow called uh, Dr. Derry, Dr. Henry Bromley Derry. And he just shoved a piece of Orlando Gibbons in my hand and said, sing. So I stood there <laughs> and I sang. He said, all right, put on this cassock, put on this surplus, put on this ruff, out there and do it. So that was my, that was my audition. Mm. <laughs> And um, the choir used to specialise really in Orlando Gibbons, Thomas Wilkes, Thomas Tompkins, uh, Thomas Tallis, with the occasional bit of Vaughan Williams thrown in. No William Bird. Um, and that was, I mean, that was a fabulous education, but always lurking beneath the surface. I mean, I used to go from there, from the choir uh, on Sunday morning, I'd go home on my bike, have my... Have my Sunday dinner, and then I'd dive off down, by the time I was 14 this was, I was still in the choir, I used to dive off down to Cy Laurie's Jazz Club for the uh, Sunday afternoon sessions. Mm. Um, and then I discovered skiffle. So for a, for a while I was in one of the school skiffle groups, there were three or four. Uh, the best one was, uh, was run by Bert Lloyd's son, who was called Joe. Um, and he, he always had, we couldn't understand where Joe got his repertoire from. He kept asking him, where are you getting all your songs? He said, oh, I'll get them from my dad. Who's your dad? Oh, he's a singer, he would say. Mm. And he was very mysterious about it, but he always had this fabulous repertoire. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that, from there I went, uh, I heard about the Princess Louise, which was one of the places Bert sang in. So I went down to the Princess Louise one night um, on a Sunday and heard Peggy Seeger and uh, Ralph Rinsler who's now the boss of the Smithsonian Institute but in those days he was uh, he sang and played mandolin probably guitar and a few other things too but I saw him as a mandolin player and um, I have a memory of Alan Lomax being around but I think I just wanted him to be there and my memory has painted him in you know <laughs> um, but there were all these people singing songs uh, which were one or two of them I recognised as being the originals of stuff that was in the hit parade, stuff like Cumberland Gap, stuff like Gambling Man. Mm. Um, well, let's have something from that time. Go on. Um, Lost John, Lonnie Donegan. Every, everybody always plays Rock Island Line, but I really do rather like Lost John. Here, now this year's a story about an escape comic called Long Gone Lost John. It's got a nice chorus, so if anybody want to join in, get the way it goes. Sing them for me, boys. Yeah. Now he's long, long, long gone. Real nice. Now he's long, long, long gone. Hear what happened to him. Now Lost John was standing by the railroad track, waiting for the freight train. Come back, the freight train come back and never made no stop. Lost John thought he'd have to ride the top. Now it's long, long, long gone. That far. Now it's long, 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 long gone. Yeah. And Lost John came me to a country woman's house. Sat there as quiet, just as quiet as a mouse. She said, Mr. Lost John, be my friend. Be my friend until the end Cause I'm long, long, long gone Hey, long, long, long gone Now, she said, Lost John, have some beer I'll send for the porter and I'll bring it here He said, now, woman, don't you buy no beer The cops is on my trail and it's to me here And I'm long, long, long gone Lost 
lost John Gwen. Now he's long, long, long gone. Hey, long, long, long gone. And the cut lost John, put him in the pen. The summer's been a gun and now he's out again. If anybody asks you who sung the song, tell him Lonnie Donegan been here and gone. Out long, long. Lonnie Donegan, one of the unsung heroes of the folk revival. Was he a hero of yours? <laughs> oh, yes. Great hero. I mean, the first time I heard Rock Island Line, it was, it was just a door opening. Mm. He, was, uh, he was fabulous. I, st I mean, I still think that's a fabulous record. I think Rock Island Line is a fabulous record. I think all those things he made then, are they really stand up very, very well now. It really was a turning point, wasn't it? Oh, it was. I mean, it was so much of... I think one of the reasons why all, all of us lot of, sort of my age, say, um, we didn't narrow our taste. We were just grateful for anything. It was, it was a time of austerity, and that was the same with, with music. And when something, some, when something like that came along, it was like a beacon suddenly... The world was flooded with light, and music was was something that hit you in the heart and in the stomach, and it was oh, it's wonderful. It was a wonderful moment. But I must say that uh, when I I heard we we had a wind up gramophone. All the records I had were seventy eight. So if I wanted to hear any EPs or LPs, whether they be ten inch or twelve inch, I had to go to my mates' houses, and. Um, one of my mates got, I think it could have been Lonnie's first 10 inch LP, it could have been his second, I don't know. But he did a recording of Frankie and Johnny, and suddenly my hero, suddenly there were cracks in, in the, you know, in the facade. I thought, wait a minute, Lonnie's doing something that I don't like. Because I had a recording of Frankie and Johnny by Frank Crummett, and I really did prefer my Rotten Old 78 version to his version. Johnny were lovers Oh Lord, how they did love For to be true to each other Just as true as the stars up above He was a man He wouldn't do her wrong Frankie went down to the corner Just for a bucket of beer She said, Mr. Bartender Has my loving Johnny been here? He is my man he wouldn't do me wrong I don't want to cause you no trouble I don't want to tell you no lie But I saw your lover half an hour ago With a girl named Nellie Bly He is your man But he's doing you wrong Frankie looked over the transom there to her great surprise There on the couch sat Johnny Making love to Nellie Bly He was a man He was doing her wrong Frankie threw back her kimono Took out a little 44 Rudy to do three times She shot right through that hardwood door She shot her man Cause it done her wrong Roll me over easy, roll me over slow Roll me over on the left side, cause your bullets hurt me so I was your man, and I'd done you wrong Bring out your rubber tied horses, bring out your rubber tied hack I'm taking my man to the graveyard and ain't going to bring him back He was my man and he'd done me wrong Bring round a thousand policemen Bring them round today To lock me in that dungeon cell And throw the key away I shot my man Cause he'd done me wrong Frankie, she said to the warden what are they going to do? The warden, he said to Frankie, is the electric chair for you. You shot your man, though he'd done you wrong. The 
Sheriff came round in the morning, said it was all for the best. He said her lover, Johnny, was nothing but a doggone pest. He was a man, but he'd done her wrong. This story has no moral, this story has no end. This story only goes to show that there ain't no good in men. He was a man, and he'd done her wrong. The well-worn 78 from the Carthy <laughs> family collection. I used, to, I used to play it on our wind-up gramophone, all, all the records I had, my Elvis records and my Lonnie Donegan records, and I used to try and play along with them if I could and sing along with them. I mean, I, at the same time as buying that, I remember hearing on the radio a, a recording of uh, a woman called Isabel Bailey singing uh, singing let the bright seraphim and absolutely flipping and rushing up to the record uh, to, to the record shop in swiss cottage and i had I, I tried to buy it immediately but they didn't have it i had to order it and um i used to sing along with this as well and when i got fed up with singing isabel bailey's part i used to try and sing the trumpet part but uh, then i was a chorister well let's have a listen to it particularly <laughs> the trumpet part <laughs>
the bright seraphim. Well, there we are, Martin. I have a mental picture of you standing there beside your wind-up gramophone in your front room, <laughs> singing the trumpet part along with Isabel Bailey. That's right. Well, I had to be careful sometimes because um, I had to make sure I had my guitar handy because across the road from... Uh, our, our, our sitting room was on the first floor and uh, across the road lived Nancy Whiskey. And when, whenever she walked past, I used to have to be nonchalantly at the window, casually strumming the guitar and looking surprised when she looked in. <laughs> at the age of 15, strutting around the window with my guitar, thrashing away with my thumb on Worried Man Blues. <laughs> where, where do you get involved with folk music from there? Um, well, I, got, I, I think I got involved because I read of a case in, in one of the papers that um, Chas McDevitt had been taken to court successfully by people who said that somebody else had written Freight Train and that somebody, else, that somebody else's name didn't register at the time. But I later found out that it was a woman called Elizabeth Cotton. And um, in about 1958 or 59, I managed to get hold of, of a Folkways album which was called Negro Folk Songs and Tunes and this Freight Train was on it and I mean I, I didn't even listen to it I went and got the record took it home borrowed a record player because we still didn't have a problem we still had our wind up borrowed a record player and played it and the first track was Wilson Rag as I remember and the second track was Freight Train <laughs> And that was recorded at a new Lost City Ramblers um, reunion some years after the record mm. you must have had, yeah, wasn't my, it? The record I had was recorded in the 50s and I lent it to someone who never, never returned it. Twice I hope you've asked. enjoyed it all these years. <laughs> but then I met her and I ate her chicken stew. 
Ha ha. Where was that? Uh, that was the very first time I went and did a proper tour in the States. It was in, uh, in just outside Los Angeles, actually. Mm. I walked into the house, exhausted from a plane journey, and walked into Elizabeth Cotton and went, oh my God, <laughs> all my <laughs> dreams have come true. It was, uh, yes, it was a great moment for me. Mm. Um, it's, I mean, it took me years to understand why I couldn't play Freight Train like, like Libba Cotton. And then I discovered that she played guitar, she took a normal right hand, what I call a normal right-handed guitar, and just turned it over and played it with the top strings nearest, nearest her face and the bass strings mm. down below. So her, f her right hand fingering was weird, but her left hand fingering was, I mean, it's, uh, yes, her left hand fingering was really, really weird indeed. She could do things that nobody else could do because she was playing upside down. <laughs> That was a great moment, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to your early musical education. Where did it go from there? Well, at about the same time as getting, this, uh, getting that particular record, um, I used to go round to, to a mate's house, a mate called Mickey Delaney, who had um, Hot 5 and Hot 7 EPs. And I decided then, and I still think, that if I couldn't play the guitar, the one thing I would really, really love to do would be able to play clarinet like Johnny Dodds. <laughs> Hot seven weary blues. Oh, I could, I'll never forget the first time I heard that clarinet solo. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It just comes. I mean, it still does the same thing to me. It still sounds as though it comes completely from another planet. Mm. That's wonderful. <laughs> still a long way from uh, what we think of as English traditional or folk music. Well, it's, for, for, as far as I'm concerned, they all they, they all have the same drive. I don't I don't see any difference between the drives of any traditional musics from anywhere. Um, anything that surprises you like that, that's, done, that's made up by a human being from nothing, is, as far as I'm concerned, is folk music. Mm. You know, the, that's it. 
Yeah. What you're hearing is folk art there. And I mean, uh, again, I tend to telescope sort of 57 to 59 um, quite quite radically, and I've no I've, I've no real clue as to the, uh, the dates of things, but I remember at around about the same time walking out of Belsize Park Station and meeting Roy Guest with in, in the company of Jeannie Robertson. I'd met Roy 57 or 58 uh, when he'd just come back from Canada, and I used to knock around in a uh, coffee bar called the Witch's Cauldron down in Belsize Lane, also another place down in Elizabeth Mews at the bottom of Primrose Gardens called the called the Loft. And I met Roy, and Roy used to play in the Witch's Cauldron, and at some other point he started doing concerts with various people, including Robin Hall. I'd heard Robin Hall talk about Jeannie Robertson, coming up in a minute. Um, and uh, I'd heard one or two records of her that were out on a label called Collector. Um, and I thought, she, oh, she's got a nice voice, but nothing, nothing prepares you for 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 genie nothing really prepares you for m actually meeting the woman in the flesh and nothing really prepared me for the for, for what i felt when i first heard her sing but it was the same thing as hearing johnny dodds bus can go bus can go bus can go ticotty's wedding fa's a lassie and the lord it wouldn't gang if they were bedding Cutty, he's a long man. Oh, he'll take his cell away fee. Gen he takes on to the tune lawn. Gen she takes on a fakey, fakey. Bus can go, bus can go, bus can go to Cutty's wedding. For the lassie and the lad to a gang. If they were bedding, Cutty, come here, ye string, Cutty, he fell out the madden. He wot his hose and tenty sheen, caught and at a canker maiden. Bus can go, bus can go, bus can go to Cutty's wedding. Well, there's Jeannie Robertson. She wasn't actually singing in these places you were going to, the coffee no. bars? And... No. The, they were more formal concerts. They'd be at somewhere like the Purcell Rooms or the Conway Hall or St Pancras Town Hall or maybe even Cecil Sharp House. Mm -hmm. They were generally speaking the places that concerts were put on. What about yourself? Were you singing by now? Oh yeah, I mean I, I'd sung uh, from the moment I heard um, heard Rock Island Line and was in the skip, one of the skiffle groups at school. I'd started singing so that in the evenings, I'd, I mean, by, eventually it became that I just I, I forewent doing my homework and um, I would just go out to to a coffee bar. The first place I went to was a place called Glebs in Flask Walk. And I'd go with my guitar and sort of thrash away and sing. Then on, during the daytime, by this time, I was singing tenor in the school choir. And then on Sundays, I was singing soprano in the, in the Savoy <laughs> Chapel choir. I'd get there at 10 o'clock with no voice. And by the time the service came round at 11.15, I'd, I'd, re I'd got to my range. I could hit all the top Gs and top As. Because the, the man who, who had taught, me to, ta taught us all to sing in the beginning, this fellow Dr Derry, I think taught you in a different way. He taught... He taught boys to sing so that if they wanted to they could go on singing soprano the rest of their lives it's just a way of producing the voice can you still do it i can't do it no, no. <laughs> you've got to practice i mean i would have to practice every sunday if i missed a sunday i was in trouble i'd have to have a little workout beforehand get to the get to the practice good and early have a little workout and then we'd have a rehearsal an hour's rehearsal and by the end of the hour's rehearsal i was i, I was in reasonable condition i think i left that choir just before my 17th birthday because i thought I thought it was very, I thought I was being very unmasculine, very unmacho. I mean, macho wasn't a word you used then. Mm -hmm. But you know, I didn't think it was right that a 17 year old should still be singing soprano. I should be singing bass, you know. And apart from anything, by this time I, I, was, I was very confused about, my, about singing because I was hearing all this wonderful music from people like Elizabeth Cotton and Big Bill Brunsey, <clears throat> who was the, I mean, and Big Bill Brunsey was the first person I ever heard play guitar excitingly and properly and it wasn't just thrashing away he just he played he played with his fingers which was something i mean at that time to play with your fingers was like a far-off dream you know <laughs> oh, 
Sahara field. I've got a partnership, woman. People you know how I feel. Lord, I'm gonna tell you people, my buddy, give me a dirty deal. Lord, I left him in my home, thought it would be fair and square. Lord, I left him in my home, thought it would be fair and square. Lord, my woman put me out. My partner's still living there Now if I ever, ever get lucky Lord and marry again Lord if I ever, ever get lucky Lord, and marry again I'm gonna buy me a bulldog Cause a dog's a man best friend Now don't you never Never think your woman Just belongs to you Now don't you never think your woman just belongs to you. Lord, if she's nice and sweet to you, she'll be sweet to your partner too. Did you ever see Big Bill Brunsey, Martin? No, I never did. Mm. Why well, ask? At that time, there seemed to be so many Americans coming over, mm -hmm. didn't they? You see them all sorts of places. I don't know why I didn't go. I mean, I'd heard the music, I knew he was around, but I never followed it up. I loved his guitar playing. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I didn't go. I mean, I took time out to go and see Ravi Shankar the very first time he came to England. And he played at the Festival Hall. And I and about 30 Indian people were sat in the Royal Festival Hall on one, one Sunday afternoon. Again, after I went straight from the, from the Savoy Chapel. Mm. There was a lot going on, wasn't there, with the coffee bars and the, the beginnings yes. of the folk clubs? Eh? It was coming out of austerity, and there was, it was, it was, there was a lot of excitement around. There was a, 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 a lot in the air. I mean, I used to play in, in this place, The Witch's Cauldron, and my hero at the time was Robin Hall, who... and. I remember him hearing. Uh, I remember hearing him sing a song called. Um, uh, we called it "Down in the Mines." It's a Mel Travis song, you know, "The Lure of the Mines," which is, again, I think. I, I think your instincts at that time are pretty damn good because I still think that is a fabulous song. There was a time when I got a bit, bit superior about it, but I heard it the other day, and it really is a cracking song. Yeah. And Robin used to sing it beautifully. And um, he used to talk about uh, about Jeannie Robertson, and he also used to talk about this place called the Troubadour. Oh, you really ought to go down the Troubadour. It's a Saturday night. It's late, um, and I was still a bit a bit young, and I didn't have any money, and I could have got down to the Troubadour, but there wasn't a snowball's chance in hell that I would ever be able to get home because it finished at two o'clock in the morning, and you had to get a taxi, and that was ten bob. You know, if you could get a taxi driver who wouldn't say, "Oh, it's more than six miles. You've got to pay double." Um, and the idea of paying ten, but I didn't have ten bob. Um, one night, I did actually go down to the troubadour, and I, um, I walked in the door. And as I walked in the door, I heard this really weird sound. And I walked in and looked, and there was this man sitting down playing the bagpipes. And I just never seen anything like this at all. And it was it was Seamus Ennis, and I don't know what tune he was playing. But I sat and I watched him all night. And I, he played the he played the pipes, he played the whistle, and he sang. And there again. My, all my, chor my, my choral training, all my choristers' tra training, was telling me that what he was singing was all, the way he was singing was all wrong. But I went home and I knew, I just he he told me a whole lot of stories, all of which I remembered. And having heard 
the Irish pipes for the first time, which just blew me clean out of my socks. of Oranmore, played by Seamus Ennis, who you first heard at the Troubadour Club in London's Earl's Court Road. Right. It, it was, it really was unique, wasn't it, the Troubadour? Well, it was one of the very few late-night places around that, uh, that people like me could go and play at. And um, the thing about late-night places was that musicians used to go and just be there after their gigs. And a lot of the people who used to go down to the Troubadour and, uh, and be there after their gigs were jazzers. And that's where I first ran up against Diz Disley, who was there. He could pretty well guarantee that Diz would show up. Mm. And he would either show up on his own or he'd show up with, with one or two of his mates. I remember there's a guy called Paul Simpson who played just about every kind of saxophone that existed. Amazing player. Um, uh, fiddle player Johnny Van Derrick. I think he came down with Diz a couple of times. But... Um, because of that, I became more in I, I became more interested in jazz. Up until then, I'd been interested in uh, in so what, what we called at the time traditional jazz. Mm. I think jazz and folk were much closer together than musicians then. Yeah, they? of course, be, be, because um, the the folk scene had, uh, as far as I was concerned, the folk scene had grown out of the uh, out of the skiffle boom, and the skiffle boom was an adjunct of the jazz scene, wasn't it? So I think it was uh, fairly natural that the two would maintain links for some time afterwards. It would have been nice if they'd maintained links all the time, but of course they haven't, with one or two exceptions. There's people like Danny Thompson, who still poke their nose around the door, thank goodness. <laughs> but um, in those days, it, it was through meeting people like Diz that I became interested in other kinds of guitar playing. And I remember people talking about Django Reinhardt and... Charlie Christian. <laughs> Thank you. 
Royal Special from Charlie Christian with the Benny Goodman Sextet. Now the time is eight o'clock. In Vogue on 2 tonight, Martin Carthy is talking about his musical influences. And after Charlie Christian, what came next, Martin? Well, I joined a group called the Thameside Four, which was um, Marion Gray, Red Sullivan and Pete Maynard. Originally, Long John Baldry had been the fourth member. Uh, he was replaced on a temporary basis by Wally Whiten. And when Wally said he really couldn't go on replacing on a temporary basis, I was, I was asked to join. Um, one of the, I mean, the, the, the breadth of repertoire of the, of, of the Thameside Four was, was enormous. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, quite a lot of English traditional stuff. We do a lot of American stuff, a lot of stuff from, um, from various of the West, you know, various of the West Indies. And, um, bits of jazz and blues and got a lot of gospel, because Marion used to love singing gospel and used to do it very well too. Um... And one day she came into rehearsal with, with a record called Forbidden Fruit by a woman called Nina Simone, who I'd never heard of at the time. And she said, this is the business. And she put on the first track, and it was just wonderful. It was, it was an Oscar Brown Jr. song called Rags and Old Iron. Buying was just rags and old 
Simone, and with the Tim Side Four, you your repertoire ranged from songs like that to British traditional material. Yeah, there were one or two in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, they were fairly fairly heady days. People had wide wide ranging repertoires. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting time. I mean, the we used to have a session every week at the Troubadour on the Tuesday, um, which wasn't a late night session. And we had a session at a, club, a pub called the King and Queen on a Friday. That was just around the back of Gooch Street, near the Middlesex Hospital. And uh, all sorts of people used to come along, and I can remember one day a particular bloke coming along whose, whose face I recognised off the front of a, of a record sleeve. It was a Folkways record of songs that had been written in protest against the stationing of American nuclear submarines at Holy Loch. And it was a chap called Nigel Denver. And he, I mean, he, he sang around for a long time. He eventually moved to, to Lincoln, and I was up doing a club he was running uh, in Lincoln when we'd finished the club. Dave and I were working, Dave Swarbrick and I were working there. And we sat down in his house and he said, listen to this, sunshine. And he played me this tape of this man singing. And it was a fellow called Joseph Taylor. And he had a couple of tracks. He had, one of them was Creeping Jane and the other one was Died for Love. And this was a moment. I wish my baby was born Lying smiling on his father's knee And I was bedroomed in my grave And green grass growing all over me I wish, I wish for this all in vain I wish I was a maid again but a maid again that never can be since that the young farmer said to you in me. Dig me my grave long wide and deep. Put a marble stone at my head and feet. But a turtle white door put over a bone but to let the world know that I died for love. And these must have been recorded right at the beginning of the century. 1908. And this was the Percy these, Granger recordings. The Percy Granger recordings, yes. He went up to Lincolnshire in 1908 and he recorded people like Joseph Taylor and others. I mean, this was, this was a name I'd heard. Joseph Taylor was a name I'd heard and it was some, somewhere so far in the past that I never thought I'd actually get to hear I actually didn't think about hearing them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see a list of names in Cecil Sharp's notebook, you don't actually think about, or I didn't then, didn't think about the way they sounded. To, to me, they were just a row of notes. Do you know what I mean? And um, suddenly to hear this was... Uh, I can truthfully say it was a blast, a real blast from the past. And it, it really did sit me up. I sat rigid, upright, listening to this man. And ever since then... I've had a fascination with the way people, way, the way names sounded. If I can actually get to see what they look like, it's great. But, and to see a picture of, uh, of Louisa Hooper in Cecil Sharp House was, is great. But when I actually went down into the, in, into the archives and found a recording of Louisa Hooper made in about 1940 by, um, by Maud Carpelis, and I can't tell you what that did. This was... Um, when Cecil Sharp went, went out in Hambridge in 1903, the person they all talk about in meeting is John England. Well, John England gave him half a dozen songs, a bomb, give or take. But Louisa Hooper and Lucy White, her sister, and their other sister, Lizzie, um, Lizzie Welch, gave him dozens of songs. All around about the same time, late, uh, late August, beginning of September 1903. And there in 1940, she recorded, and then in 1960, frozen to death, I'm sitting there listening to a recording of this woman. And it was the most, it was the most thrilling experience. Georgia, it is 
she had a son, she and he stole the king's deer and went and told him in Bohenny. Mm -hmm. And then I, he was hanged, she in a golden yeah. chain. Yeah. yeah, that's hanging too. Yeah. <laughs> My Georgie shall be hanged in a golden chain, and that's a chain of many. He stole sixteen of a king's royal deer, and he stole them in Bohemia. He stole sixteen of a king's royal deer, and he stole them in Bohemia. Oh, he never stole no ducks, nor no geese, nor he never murdered any. He stole sixteen of the king's royal deer, and he stole them in Bohemi. Only Georgie shall be hanged in a golden chain, and that's a chain of many. He stole sixteen of the king's royal deer, and he sold them in Bohemia. It's a pretty song. Mm -hmm. yeah. feeling going right that way back, nice. isn't it? I, 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 it's the sort of thing that I absolutely love. I have a friend who lives in Seattle who is called Hank, uh, Hank Bradley. And Hank is... Uh, he talks about listening to recordings like that as like looking down a telescope the wrong way. Mm. And you can just see something at the end and you... Well, you just the excitement is actually trying to pick out exactly what it is. Well, Martin, it gives some indication of your interest in English traditional music and where that comes from. What about your guitar style? Well, the guitar players I admire. I'm 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 not actually particularly crazy about guitar players as a general rule. Most of my uh, favourite instrumentalists play other instruments. They play things like fiddles and pipes and uh, and whistles and flutes and. Well, anything really. But I, I think that most of my early life has. Uh, I was affected by directness. Any um, examples I took, any role models, if you like, were, um, were people who spoke directly with the voice and the guitar. When you hear, Eliz when you hear uh, Libba Cotton singing Freight Train, she's tracing what she's singing on the guitar or she's tracing what she's playing with her voice, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, with Big Bill Brunsey, you've got a, a similar kind of directness, but what he's doing there is he's doing a question and answer thing. He sings a line, then plays a line, and sings a line and plays a line. With people like um, Mance Lipscomb, what you get is he, what he's doing is actually following exactly what he's sing well, sorry, exactly what he's singing with his guitar while he's singing. But I like that sort of that sort of directness uh, and anything anything I've achieved is actually I think thanks to people like Brunsey and Mance on the guitar is is, is due to people like Libercotton, Mance Lipscomb and Big Bill Brunsey Good. and people like that who speak directly <laughs> I've been drinking and whiskey all night long, got to heat it now. Yes, I've been drinking bad whiskey all night long. Oh, Lord, Mama, got to heat it now. Tell me what you're going to do with your brand new tiny bottle spoon. Tell me what you're going to do with your brand new bottle. Oh, Lord, Mama, about a spoon. And late last night when I come home from getting a spoonful Heaven late last night, I'll come home from getting a spoonful Oh, Lordy Mama, oh, Lord Danny, just a spoonful All I want, baby, in this world, oh, baby, just a spoonful even Adam was the first two people got a spoonful. Tell me, even Adam was the first two people. Oh, Mama got a spoonful. Late last night, I lay down and got a spoonful. Baby, late last night, I lay down. Oh, Mama got a spoonful. 
drinking baby whiskey all night long. Got a headache now. I've been drinking baby whiskey all night long. Oh, mama got the headache now. Martin, I'm interested in what you're saying about directness. Would you like to develop that? I don't know if I can. Is um, there's a there's a lot of people around singing and playing who who introduce a lot of artifice into I, into it into singing and playing, and I think I've probably done my fair share of that, or maybe even more than my fair share of that. But I think. All the people I loved, even through even through that, were all people who were that direct. And when I chose to sit down and listen to them and absorb the lessons, was when things began to make sense for me properly on stage and on record. I think it's possible to sing. Well, ha! Thanks to Tony Savage in Leicester, I discovered that it was. Uh, perfectly possible for a person to be surrounded by a huge orchestra and still speak so directly that it can just it can it can shake you right to the right to your roots and the very first time he played me Maria Callas I don't think I recovered for about two hours towards the end of the program Martin I, I wonder if there are any other musical influences uh, on your life I think in all the time I've been involved with this music there is one person who stands out as being quite extraordinary um, and an influence in a in a very indirect way he would uh, come and stand at your shoulder and maybe offer you a uh, offer you a piece of music or a song if you did something nice or something he thought was good, he would ring you up or write you a little letter, and that's Bert Lloyd. He was a quite extraordinary man. Um, it was a sad day when he died. He was a very special, extraordinary man. Let's have one final example, musical example. Martin, what should we finish? 
Well, a couple of years ago, I was involved in um, in a recording with Ashley Hutchings when he did his, I always call it his Cecil Sharp on a bike record. Um, an, hour, an hour with Esh with Ashley Hutchings and Cecil Sharp, or was it the other way around? Um, and one of the things he gave me to listen to was, was a little fragment of the banks of the Nile. And I sprinted off to Cecil Sharp House and I got the rest of it, courtesy of Malcolm Taylor. And... Um, I don't know who this. I don't think anybody knows. I don't think it's been, I don't think it's been worked out who this this man singing on this uh, recording is. This is but this is this recording. is another cylinder recording, which pre presumably makes it about 1908 to 1910. Um, it's either recorded by Granger, Percy Granger, or Cecil Sharp, possibly Vaughan Williams or Lucy Broadwood, but nobody knows. Oh, from the beating, no longer can I stay. I hear the bugle sounding, my love, I must work. How many is a long while to go fight those black and even from the banks of the Nile. Hark, I hear the drums have beaten, no longer can I stay. I hear the bugle sounding, my love, I cast away. We are called up for orders, and it's men, it's a long mile to go fight with all those legions on the banks of the Nile. Oh, Willie, dearest Willie, don't. Leave me here to mourn. You'll make me cousin through the day that ever I was born. For the parting of my own true love is a parting of my life. Stay at home, dear William. I will be your wife I will cut off those yellow locks And I'll go along with you I'll dress myself in velveteen And go and see Egypt too I'll fight and bear your banner while kind fortune on me smile and we'll comfort one another on the banks of the Nile. Oh Nancy, dearest Nancy, with me you cannot go. For our colonel has given orders, no women there can go. You will forget your own true love when you are on the shore. And you'll think of things that please your mind and new loves will please you more. Said be those cruel bloody wars that took my love from me. And cursed be the order that put his boat to sea. I fear the burning sun will shine his beauty to destroy. And his blood will seep in the grass that's deep On the banks of the Nile
Martin Carthy, who tonight has been talking about his musical influences. My name's Jim Lloyd, producer Geoffrey Hewitt. Good night. <laughs> in Carthy and his arrangement of La Cardeurs. Well, next week, Jim Lloyd returns at the same time with another unusual edition of Folk on Two, this time featuring the women of the Bulgarian State Radio and Television Choir in concert from the Royal Festival Hall in London. That's Folk on Two, 7 o'clock next Wednesday evening.